Welcome to Border Life. In this episode, The Border's Clothing Company, helping Hollywood to tell the story of real-life war heroes. They were quite secretive. They had a different working name, had to sign an NDA. In total, there was about 40 jackets, various styles and colours, but the, the real standout jacket was this very early 1937 B3 that I've watched the first two episodes and it features very heavily. It all happens in a humble workshop in Gala Shields. They'll be telling us their story later in the programme. Welcome back to Border Life. We're heading now to Gala Shields and a clothing company which is helping to recreate history for the small screen. Here's Bruce McKenzie. As to the target itself, the target is of great importance to the enemy in the conduct of the war. If we do a successful job, the progress of the war is going to be improved a very great deal. I know we're going to do a successful job. All crews report back here upon return to the base. That's all. On daring and often traumatic long-range missions, the crews of the US 8th Air Force pushed their planes and their bodies to the limits. Over the last three years of the Second World War, they flew with a simple goal, to speed up victory by hitting German industrial targets hard. But that was anything but easy for the so-called bomber boys, who spent hours, often injured by gunshot wounds, in planes with no heating. They were at risk as much from the cold as enemy guns. One item of kit became not just essential, but particularly special to air crews. Hard-wearing leather jackets lined with sheepskin. Years later, the B-3 bomber jacket would go on to become a style icon. But its creation was all about keeping crews warm and able to move to fly their planes. One of the most revered of the group known as the Masters of the Air was Major John Bucky Egan, whose jacket was a little different from the brown ones around him. He did actually wear a white B3, and I believe he had the mickey taken out of him, but I think he had this earlier version which got phased out for later coated versions, but he liked to look different than everyone else, so he chose to keep it. Egan is a central character in a new $250 million TV series immortalising the exploits of the group. Its production was led by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, known for their attention to detail in historical drama. And that's why they called Gala Shields. The town is home to one of just a handful of businesses in the world, which hand makes leather jackets to be exact replicas of the wartime era. And that led to an order for 40 jackets. They were quite secretive. They had a different working name, had to sign an NDA. But they sent us pictures of a very unusual, very rare um, early B3 flight jacket, which was uh, unsealed, so it was white in finish. But through pictures and a lot of detailed measurements, we were able to recreate it. In total, there was about 40 jackets, various styles and colours, but the, the real standout jacket was this very early 1937 B3 that I've watched the first two episodes and it features very heavily. Um, in amongst a sea of brown flight jackets, this white jacket stands out. It wasn't by accident that the Aero Leather team got the job they've steadily built a reputation on the silver screen. Over the years, we've been involved in many films. The first one being Empire of the Sun, back in, I think, 1987. Uh, Captain America, more recently, The Dig, Bohemian Rhapsody. 
we've got quite a good reputation within wardrobe circles. Uh, we always go out of our way to work with the wardrobe department, who usually work in under quite tight time constraints. And obviously, if we make this make the silver screen, then that's great. And people will be surprised that that you're having to make multiple versions of the jacket. Yeah. So in films. The character could go through all sorts of situations. In Masters of the Air, he's in um, bombing missions, so the jacket gets covered in oil, um, and it's, it's maybe set over a course of a couple of years, so the jacket will naturally age. So if they have to go back and reshoot a scene, and they've dirtied a jacket up or damaged it, they need multiple copies that they can then go back, reshoot, or they might have some on set, some on location. A few years back, we made jacket for Captain America. In the movie, it's one jacket that he happens to get blown up in. We had to make 46 identical jackets just for that one jacket on the film. And I think it only, only got about 10 minutes airtime. The craftsmen and women here make around 3,000 jackets a year. Several end up on the shoulders of the rich and famous, from actors like Daniel Craig and Johnny Depp, to rock front men Dave Grohl and Axl Rose. It's due to a reputation built by Denny's dad, Ken. In London, in the 1970s, he dressed the likes of Susie Quattro, Elton John and Noddy Holder, before heading home to Scotland, where he first settled with his young family in Moffat. Ken, you're hard at work. What are you making? Uh, I'm making caps like these. Where will they go? Uh, this one's going to Kensington, to um, shop in Kensington High Street. And sell for quite a price, no doubt. Um, 20 odd pound, probably, yeah. Now, tell us how you got started in the clothing business in London. I knew how to machine, and I knew a lot of people in the music business who'd been in a band, and uh, I started making clothes for them, take advantage of the contacts. And I had a little shop in Kensington, and um, gradually expanded it. I think got a bit out of hand. What do you mean by out of hand? Um, too many ridiculous requests, too many strange outfits, and too much paperwork. Despite Ken's plan at that time for an easier life, his jackets business soon expanded, and that took them to Gala Shields. The new generation at the helm stick to tried and tested methods. We've got an imaginary cut-off date of 1959 here. It stems plain from our father. In his eyes, from 1959 onwards, quality went downhill, things became mass-produced, but also some of the design elements weren't, weren't as good as they were in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and then you've got the 70s fashion, which was quite questionable. So everything we make, be it leather jackets, be it knitwear, be it shoes, style-wise, is all from 1959 or before, but also the materials we use and the construction techniques. So we don't use any synthetic fibers, it's all natural. It's like st stepping back in time, really. We're either reproducing exact replicas, so with our military jackets, um, like we've done for Masters of the Air, we're replicating as close to original um, the jackets that were made during the war, right down to the labels, the zip types. Below the busy workshop, Denny shows me where life starts for each and every jacket. So this is, this is our main leather store, so this is where everything arrives. Um, it all arrives tanned and ready for us to use, so we don't do any dyeing in-house. Skins are ready to go. Um, our main supplier is a tannery in America called Halloween. It's probably the, the oldest remaining tannery still in the States, and they're world famous. They make all the leather for NFL footballs, uh, baseball gloves, uh, all the presidents that have been inaugurated have worn hauling leather on their shoes. Um, so they're, yeah, they're a great company to work with. We've got pretty much exclusive use of this particular product. It's called Chrome XL. It's a horse hide. There isn't a, a, a mass off the leather, so they're limited source, and we take so much off it from them. Um, I can always pull out a skin for you to yeah, have a, a look. We'll a look. Op open it up. It's quite heavy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is how it arrives to us. This is, these are nice fresh skins. Um, you'll see straight away the difference in shapes. They're all quite irregular shapes and sizes. No two skins are the same. Um, 
much like a fingerprint. So it's an art in itself, even just the cutting of the jackets. They've got to select the skins for consistency in weight, color, thickness. They might need to select maybe four skins to make a jacket, depending on the size. But to select those four skins, they might have to go through 10 or 12 just to find four that are, that are matching. Uh, and there must be a lot of work to make sure that you use every available bit of yeah, it. Yeah, we, we try and be as sustainable and economical as possible. Um, there's certain areas we would avoid. So here, that's the, the, the mane of the horse. Some are worse than others. So we try and avoid putting that in the jacket. We might put it somewhere discreet, like maybe under the collar or somewhere that's not going to be seen. Um, but there's obvious, obvious flaws that you would avoid. And how many pieces will be cut from a skin to make a standard kind of jacket? How many panels in a jacket? It, it can be, it just depends on the style. It could be anything from about 15 up to 25, 30. Depends on, on some of our jackets have multiple paneled backs. Something like this just has a one piece back. Uh, it varies. We cater for all. <laughs> With thousands of garments shipped overseas each year, those export markets are quietly bringing lots of trade to the borders and sustaining 20 jobs in Gala Shields. There's a bit of a Willy Wonka, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory vibe here because you walk past the door and you might not know this hive of activity that's going on here. It's quite discreet, yeah, there's no windows, there's a little black doorway. If you look up, there is a, there's a hint with a sign, but we, we speak to people that have lived locally for years and walk past every day. They don't really have a clue what's going on behind closed doors. Production-wise, we're making approximately 50, 50 jackets a week. And each of those jackets are made by one machinist from start to finish, so we're not we're not doing any sort of production lines. It's their garment. They sign it at the end. In, in, the, in the pocket, there's a little ticket with the maker's name and the customer's name. And they take a bit of pride in it because it's traceable to them. And the next jacket they make could be something completely different. So it keeps their day interesting. And after a while, some of our repeat customers, some have huge, huge collections. They might start then requesting a certain machinist to make their jacket because um, a certain machinist might have done a really good job on their previous jacket. So Julie's our longest full-time serving machinist. She's been with us now, I believe it's 32 years. We estimate she's made probably up to about 16,000, 17,000 now. So yeah, very, very experienced. The white jackets for Masters of the Air were all made by Tony, whose specialism is working with sheepskin. And now he's being kept busy by orders from fans of the show who want their own version. It's pretty special to have these jackets finally like recognised and stuff on a on a like a big scale on a on a place where obviously like millions of people are gonna actually see it. One of the things that, that really appeals to me about here is the fact that you know, you do the whole jacket. Yeah. How, how nice is that as a craftsperson? Uh, it's really good because it's, it's solely mine. Do you know, like whatever goes into that has been only me. And it's a rare thing these days not to have somebody doing sleeves, somebody doing pockets. Who wants to work in that sort of scenario? That's yours, you love that jacket. Do you know what I mean? Everything that you do goes into that jacket. With his dad still involved in the background, now semi-retired to Inverness, Denny hopes to keep steadily growing the business. He thinks the timeless appeal of leather jackets means they'll always have a market. I think there's been a, the last few years, there's been a, a real interest in trying to move away from fast fashion and sort of embrace well-made clothing. Um, maybe there's a, they call it a heritage scene. So, so people are appreciating clothes as they were made. Our clothing, yeah, it might cost that little bit more, but it's going to last for years and years. And we build them in a way that they can be repaired. So like a good pair of shoes that can be resold. Our jackets are going to last a lifetime. With the company bringing in new machinists to learn the craft and growing exports, the people behind this business hope to keep helping put Gala Shields on the map. 
for some time to come. Bruce McKenzie ending this edition of Border Life. Don't forget to join us again next time. <laughs>